Well, the Greeks held that the visual arts were the imitation of life, but the computer arts are the imitation of creation itself. Thank you very much. I would like to get started with the afternoon session by introducing our next speaker. In the 50s, you have already seen uh, the magical world of MIT, but what one has to realize is that MIT was a very singular point on the American landscape. Uh, it was a, a very lush and rich environment in both in people and material. And something was unfolding there that very badly needed to be distributed across the landscape of the United States. That is not something that is trivially or was trivially accomplished it took not only a ripening of the computer field, but it also took money, and it took an imagination with the control and access to support in order that this take place. Our next speaker, J.C.R. Licklider, found himself invited to participate in such an activity and indeed to direct it. Prior to the beginning of the ARPA program, computation in the United States, except for a few isolated places, was a, the devotion of machines and people to providing application programs and support for the sciences, the technology, and industry. That was the role of the computer. And for them, batch processing, for example, was quite adequate. And indeed, no need for interactive computing was seen as terribly important. What our next speaker did was to galvanize into action in more and more places, the imagination and energy of people who were willing to see the computer as much more, that the computer itself had a dynamism attached to it that was quite independent of, and really had to flower independent of, the applications with which it had been saddled. And to give these people the freedom to operate, to train students, to do research. <coughs> what was needed was a galvanizing action, and I now introduce that galvanizing action, J.C.R. Licklider. Well, thank you, Alan, for being more kind than honest. I had the, uh, well, f first it's a, a great pleasure and a privilege and an honor to be here with you and discuss this topic. I had another privilege a few years back to attend a meeting on the history of computing at Los Alamos, where incidentally I was the second youngest participant. Uh, <laughs> Fernando Corbato was there and he's a, a little younger. 
but mainly it was the old boys of the field, and it quickly appeared that the main purpose was for each to establish that he was the inventor of the general purpose computer. <laughs> so I'm going to start this by telling you how I invented the workstation. Uh, my family and I lived at that time about a mile out of Mount Kisco, New York. We were having a few people over for uh, cocktails, and my wife discovered we were out of gin and dispatched me to the village. And uh, I guess there was plenty of time because I remember thinking I can walk, I need the exercise, but I have to take the shortcut. It was just then getting a little dark, and I made my shortcut through the cemetery. And to make a list, longish story short, I stepped into an open grave. It was uh, pretty deep, and I started scrambling like this, and dirt came down on me, and I realized I'll never get out of here this way. I'd better sit down and think. So I went over to the end of the grave and sat there and contemplated a little bit, and this idea came into my mind that... Well, I get lots of ideas, so that wouldn't really have done it, but there was a clincher. Very shortly, there was a, a thud, and another guy fell into this same grave. <laughs> he was facing the other way. He didn't see me. He was much more excitable than I. He was jumping around screaming, and I said, better watch out, you'll have a heart failure. <laughs> <laughs> so he leapt out of the grave, <laughs> and his... His heel caught me in the jaw, <laughs> broke my jaw, but cemented this, this idea of the workstation. <laughs> so, so the best I'm going to be able to do with, it, uh, with you here today is, uh, you know, I really apologize for not showing up with these beautiful movies. I'm totally impressed with the, the visual medium here, but I can't uh, do that, so I'm going to try to, to formulate a few issues that seem to me quite important. Maybe these aren't the germinal issues of workstations, but they're issues. And then fill in with some recollections of how it used to be. Uh, the first general issue area I want to deal with is the delimitation issue. Uh, how are we defining what we're talking about? Uh, do the workstations have to be digital, for instance? Uh, do they have to be really personal, or can they be uh, shared with others uh, on a time-sharing, that is like a time-shared condo? Or can they be part of a, is it, do we focus only on individual tasks, or are individual tasks that are embedded in group tasks all right? There's a, a, a lot of reason for adopting a broad delimitation rather than a narrow one, because if you're trying to find out where ideas came from, you don't want to delimit away from you the areas that they came from. And so we have the rich history, even prior to, uh, well, maybe contemporary with the first digital computers, the rich history of analog computers simulations of aircraft, cockpits, and so on, and the whole movement of uh, during World War II in the design and development of combat information centers, which were electronic workplaces for groups of people dealing with military problems. Uh, I remember aircraft, care, uh, aircraft cockpit simulations very early at the University of Illinois Alex Williams had a laboratory devoted to aviation. Stanley Roscoe was there. And uh, they knew a lot of things and, and understood a lot of problems that are important in the work station area. Uh, I spent a couple of summers working at Hughes Aircraft Company, and I remember on the lunch hour getting to fly an airplane simulator. It was pretty abstract, and I had trouble with the rudders, which seemed to me to work the wrong way. But all you had to do was turn the airplane upside down, and then it flew in the way I thought was, was right. <laughs> there was a, a beautiful simulator based on analog equipment of uh, interceptions, where you'd have a bomber and an interceptor airplane, and the vector controller would vector the interceptor to the bomber and all this sort of thing. 
trouble with that was it, you know, I, I heard this morning about something that took 30 days to shut down. I think that turned out to mean shut down, fix, and bring back up. I was visualizing 30 days just to shut it down. But the Hughes thing really did take 30 days to shut down or 30 days to bring up because every, instead of programming, it was putting little patch cords into patch cord sockets, and there were hundreds or thousands or, or tens of thousands of them. And it was estimated that nobody ever got the thing set up right. Uh, at Beaver Tail Island uh, off uh, Newport, Rhode Island, there was, uh, during World War II, a big high-priority crash project to develop combat information centers. And a lot of the problems of displays and uh, I think there were light guns at Beaver Tail Island, but I'm not sure. There, but you got to be very careful about deciding you invented something like that because there's a, a lot of backlog. Uh, the SAGE system, the L systems, WIMIX, SAC, NORAD, over in NATO, down in Norfolk, there's a thing that I think now is clearly beyond the limits. The Navy has this big display place with two-story high displays where the whole ocean situation is depicted. One of the issues in here is whether we're dealing with general purpose workstations or special purpose workstations. For general purpose ones, we seem to have some restriction to generic software. It seems not to be economic to have really widespread systems that are used for everybody's workstations that, do, that go much beyond word processing and database and graphics and communication, a few functions like that. Uh, how, how the average individual is going to get the special purpose stuff that he requires, I'm not so sure. At any rate, there, there's a, a lot of problem in the delimitation area, and I'm for taking a kind of a broad view of it, and I think, in fact, we have already started to do that today. Now, about input, the, the workstation seems to me has input, it has output, it has uh, some coordination of input and output, it has users, and then it has a set of general problems about coherent standards and the like. On the input side, a lot of a lot of the treatment is going to be treatment of input devices and which one is better than which other one. Uh, in particular, in the keyboard area, uh, there's a, a long-standing thing. I, I think that one of the great inventions was Doug Engelbart's invention of the one-handed keyboard. But there's an awful lot of human factors and ergonomics wrapped up in that. And in fact, very few people, maybe Doug is the only one, very few people use one-handed keyboards. It's, it has to be based on a stenotype-like keyboard scheme with uh, multiple finger pressings. It takes some learning, very valuable after you've learned it. But I sort of conclude from an, on a number of bases that uh, people, the people who are buying computers, especially personal computers, just aren't going to take a long time to learn something. They're going to insist on using it awfully quick. Easy to use, easy to learn, and, and quick to learn. Another thing that I think Doug invented is, is the mouse. Now, the, the there's an issue there. Mouse works with a hand offset from the target from the work. Um, Herb Jenkins at the Lincoln Laboratory back in the early in the early 50s did studies to determine how various data takeoff arrangements depended upon how much offset there was between the hand and the work and plotted function and showed it's bad by a factor of two to get off eight or ten inches. And yet uh, that seems not to have dimmed the popularity of this, this mouse device. Uh, I know 20 people who use mice for every person who uses a light pen. I can't understand that, but it uh, seems to be true. Um, we, we saw light guns and light cannons and so forth, um, track balls, joysticks. The RAND tablet, I think I should mention the Tiger tablet, which was competitive with the RAND tablet. Um, 
often we get in a situation where it's just a little engineering detail of how it's implemented. I think the RAND tablet was a capacitative device and the Tiger table an inductive device, but both used a stylus and both used a flat surplane surface on which to move it. Uh, touch sensitive screens. I remember back in uh, on well, my first stand in ARPA, which was 62 to 64, touch sensitive screens up in Ottawa at some government laboratory. Probably they go wet back way before that. But um, if I hadn't seen that, I thought Hewlett Packard invented them. Well, one of the areas that uh, we probably need to concern ourselves with is the the workstation for the school. There are, what, 40 million students out there? There's a market potential for 40 million workstations. And uh, I think that's a, a very interesting thing to think about. There's the problem, the, the, the idea of instrumenting the body of the user. Um, hasn't gone anywhere so far, really. I remember Craig Fields had an instrumented cushion on the chair, and the computer knew something about how, my, how much the user was fidgeting around. And there have been various efforts to uh, get data takeoff from the, for the skull, electroencephalographic life. And a fellow, I've forgotten his name now, at um, Stanford Research Institute, was claiming to be able to distinguish among 15 different words that the user merely thought on the basis of the computers registering the signals from the brain. And uh, if that could be brought up to a few thousand, that would be very useful indeed. Um, a thing that, let's see, this is, uh, if we're talking about input, um, a thing that I want is instrumented fingers. I have this terrible problem of having the keyboard in the middle of my workspace, and yet the keyboard is pretty clearly on its way out in favor of graphics. I want really a stylus pad there or something to write on. I want that incidentally to be the display too, but I'll come back to that. But um, when, when I want to, to reach and point to something with a light pen then, I really want a, a detachable fingernail that's got the light pen function in it so I can just uh, type away. And now I wonder why I have to have keys of any kind to type on, because if there are accelerometers on my fingers, then uh, the, you don't need the keys. Incidentally, I've never heard anybody discuss this from an informational point of view, but it's obvious, if you just think of it, that typing is capable of transferring more information than is actually used, because there's information in which finger touches the key as well as in which key is touched. And if you could learn to type in such a way that you touch the same key with different fingers, then, uh, well, you can see how that... <laughs> uh, on the subject of color, uh, Bert Green, back in, in the early 50s, uh, did an analysis of what color can be used for in displays, and I think really understood some things about it. He found, for instance, that if you have a display screen full of uh, words printed in different colors, that you, it, the length of time it takes you to find one, if you're told to find the, the red word alpha, and they're all arrayed in different orientations on the screen, that's the same time as if Alpha had been present in black and white, and there hadn't been anything but the ones that were represented in red. That is to say, the color essentially rules out all of the other stimuli. And that seems like a, a very worthwhile thing to know in the design of, because, you know, now you get a workstation almost surely monochrome because you want the very high resolution. Uh, Sutherland's PDP-1 at Harvard uh, had uh, interesting input. Uh, he had a gizmo that you wore like a hat that connected through a lever to something up in the ceiling so the computer could tell what you were looking at. <laughs> 
and then the computer generated what you ought to see if you're looking in that direction. And that created, that was a marvelous display situation. Oh, the, the uh, cathode ray tube was worn on, a, on the same head rig, and the output of it went directly into your eyes, so you could move your head around and see different parts of the, uh, of the situation. And it was nice on the computer because it had, didn't have to display what you weren't looking at. Now, over on the output side, uh, all the workstation stuff is very, very heavily visual, although it could be auditory, and I think that's coming with uh, increasing capacity of the computer to deal with speech. Uh, the skin is interesting, too. A fellow named Frank Geldart at Virginia set up arrangements, uh, an arrangement, a big matrix of vibrators on the back of the user, and after a certain amount of training, the user could, could read stuff typed into his back, which <laughs> is kind of nice. Uh, with cathode ray tubes, we have this problem, should they be deep or flat? And um, pretty obviously you want them flat. The Japanese have now recently, if you have been following all this, invented the flat display. But uh, indeed, Willie's West Coast Electronics back in the late 40s or early 50s was making displays that are only one inch deep and uh, regular ca big cathode ray screen size, anyway, anyway a square foot. Uh, that's nice. They, they, were, they were making them transparent so you could see through them, uh, and their idea was to use them as the windscreens in fighter aircraft. So the, the whole windscreen would be a cathode ray tube, and you could uh, draw on the cathode ray tube schematic pictures of airplanes and the like. And so if you, you'd be intent on those, and then just sort of change your depth of focus a little bit, you'd look out and see the real airplane that was depicted by the one in the cathode ray tube. Uh, Sutherland's PDP-1 seemed to me to indicate something about resolution. There were four of these deck million display element displays that uh, Gordon Bell mentioned. And with the four of them, I think really they weren't set up. The people who build those put big boxes around them, so you can't put the cubes nicely side by side without unpackaging everything. So you really had to turn around too far to see the sad ones. But it's really marvelous for programming at any rate, and I'm sure many other purposes, to have a um, really big display area. And now while we're at it, might as well get around to this horizontal versus nearly horizontal versus nearly vertical orientation. I just can't for the life of me understand why we continue to put up with these vertical screens when really, well, you want those, but you also want display area that you can write on as well as the computer that you can write notes to each other on. And so I go back to a recollection of Mort Bernstein's uh, at, S at SDC, a display of his on which text was projected up on the underside of a kind of translucent uh, sheet, and uh, the user could write proofreading, proofreader's marks on this sheet, and uh, well, it was pretty early, and so the brightnesses were not very great, and you'd better turn off the lights in the room in order to do this, but you could, in fact, edit something and just watch your proofreader's marks control the text, and as the text changed, the proofreader's marks disappeared. And that, I'm sure, is the way it needs to be done. It's just a matter of engineering, and now we can do all those things. So it, it must not be... You, you followed the Japanese work on flat displays based on liquid crystal and electroluminescence. And they're talking about now wall-sized tele television displays uh, in color of several feet by several feet. And if you can have it on the wall, you can sure have it on your desk. Uh, the plasma display is a pretty neat idea still. That's just a, a really, it's a manufacturing problem. Uh, they've stayed expensive over the years. I guess we ought to observe. Uh, I was thinking about this just the other day. Uh, one of the really fundamental curves in our industry uh, 
is the curve that shows how the cost effectiveness of computer hardware decreases with time. Gordon Bell addressed that and came up with 20% per year. I think he said also 36% or something. Maybe I've forgotten. Maybe 36% was two years. I just want to um, say that seems to me so an important, so important an issue. We should get it absolutely straight. And I remember Larry Roberts uh, did a little paper on that back around 1970 that covered. Uh, well, I'll let Larry tell about that later. But Larry's uh, conclusion was more like double every two years. In fact, it was a little better than that. 1.56 was the exponent of the uh, increase. So I was thinking about that and realizing now that really talks about computer hardware. Does it also talk about displays? And I was sitting in front of um, Vax Station 2 and uh, looking at the pixels. And there are 1,024 by 896, I believe. I didn't count them all. I just counted them this way and this way. <laughs> and um, then I remembered sitting in front of the display of a PDP-1, which was indeed a 1,000. Well, it was a vector display. And so you're talking about resolution. And it was a little unstable so that a point that's supposed to be here would move a little bit in the course of a minute or two. But sensibly, it gave you a resolution of two points that were only one thousandth of the width or height away from each other. And then looking at costs and so forth, it's clear that there can't be a factor of more than about 10 or 20 of improvement in cathode ray display on computers, whereas the factor of improvement in the processor and the rest of the computer is well over a thousand in that time. In fact, I think a TRS-8100, which you can get if you get a little special permission for $399 at Radio Shack, is almost exactly a PDP-1 in, in performance, except about ten times as fast. I should have mentioned that. Now let's see. Uh, the, the size of, of displays. There was a time when Dumont came to the Lincoln Laboratory and almost wrangled a contract to build a 20-foot cathode ray tube. And, of course, for a personal workstation, you say you don't really need such a thing. But um, I find it helpful to have a projector in the lab projecting on the wall so I can look up from the console screen and see some big array of information. Nick Negroponte and his people in the uh, media technology part of MIT have done a lot of studies on, graphical, on uh, spatial data management. And one of the really nice things is to have this big display to, to supplement, to add to what you can do with the, with the little ones. And, uh, See what else I want in here. Well, speaking of projectors, takes me back to a time I was uh, talking with John Gould at MIT, I mean at IBM Research in Yorktown, who was using a projector in connection with uh, some educational software. He had a display, but he also had a projector, and it was a neat, neat trick. It was a, an Eastman Kodak carousel with the label still on it, put in a kind of hard-to-open box with an IBM label on the outside. And John explained to me this is just the ideal setup. As long as it works, they think IBM made it. <laughs> oh, I, I've gotten lost here, obviously, so I'll pull, pull myself back together. On the subject of the horizontal displays, um, well, first, in, in World War II, there were planned position indicators called PPIs, which were cathode, cathode ray tubes, big ones, usually about like so, that uh, were oriented horizontally with the face horizontal. And the people did the necessary work to keep the phosphor from falling off the screen down into the electron gun and shorting it out. And those were very useful displays. And I would like to see some of those show up in the computer world. Uh, in fact, I, I was sort of in on the purchase of the very first 
digital computer uh, digital equipment PDP-1 when I worked at Bolt, Peranic, and Newman. Ed Fredkin was the one who did the go-between with, with DEC, and I told Ed, but one thing we really want to get is a scope that swivels. And I think I explained, you know, so that you can put it down and write on it or put it up and use it in the regular way. And then I went off on a trip, and when I came back, I asked Ed how the PDP-1 was coming, and he said, oh, great, and I think you'll really like the swiveling thing. We even hired a design consultant and so forth. And uh, so I went out to look at it, and indeed it swivels, but as you may have seen in the pictures this morning, it swivels the wrong way. And so I'm still a little frustrated about writing on the cathode ray tube. Now, a discussion like this really ought to deal with the parameters of processing, but um, it's very hard to tell when you stop talking about workstations and when you're just talking about computers in general. Processors have been getting better very, very rapidly, getting smaller, getting less expensive for a given amount of power or more powerful for a given cost. I remember back to the LG P30, which was the first computer I really got to sit at the console of lots and lots of hours. The LG P30 was made by Royal McB, and uh, I guess Fredkin was around then too, and he took me down to see one. I was worried about the ease of use of the thing. It sounded a little difficult because it, for instance, had, oh, 20 or 30 or 40 tubes, vacuum tubes, and since they needed more amplification than that, they used what was then a standard technique of taking the signal that comes out of this row of amplifiers, heterodyning it up in frequency and putting it back through the same amplifiers. And so I don't know how many times your train of pulses went through the amplifier of this before it finally got big enough to drive the display. But um, I was worried about that. So we got down to the place where they had one and uh, got the instruction book. I said, Ed, can you just make it multiply three by four? And he said, well, you're not going to like this, but uh, we can. Uh, first, you have to know that there are 31 bits in the accumulator and only 29 in the memory registers. And we put everything in through the accumulator, so before putting it in, we have to multiply it by four in order so when you knock two bits off going into memory, it's the right size. <laughs> and so we multiplied the three by the four and got 12, put in the 12, multiplied the four by four and got 16, put that in, multiplied those two, got whatever you get with that, and then came the argument, now do we shift back by dividing by four, or do we shift back by dividing by 16? Well, four went out in that, and the answer came out 12, all right. But that was um, that was my first sort of experience with personal workstation. <laughs> my second experience with that was uh, to use a program that I knew full well. I had been running on an analog computer, GA Philbrick analog computer, for those of you who remember that. This thing solved the problem 30 times a second and displayed it so that you could see the output on the scope and, and turn the knobs and see what affected what. And that's what you're really trying to do with a digital computer most of the time anyway, I think, is, is work your way into an understanding of the problem. So I thought, why don't I program that to run it on the LGP30? And I wrote the program, and I think with Ed's help we got it debugged. But it took two and a half days to run. And this thing wouldn't run two and a half days. It was <laughs> down about every three hours. And so, of course, eventually you do invent checkpointing. Now, I'll claim that, too. And uh, <laughs> trouble was you, the only thing to checkpoint on was, was paper tape. And the reliability of the paper tape was such that, well, you <laughs> understand the problem. Now, let's see. We ought to talk about software. In fact, uh, John Brackett said we really ought to deal with software, and I can't do it adequately now, and in fact, time is just about gone. Um, let's note, however, that somebody along the line has invented closed software. Back in the early days, software was uh, pretty much a public commodity. If somebody had some that you wanted, you wrote a letter and maybe you sent a tape or something, or maybe IBM cards and you got it back. But then when the uh, big interest got into it. It turned out to be lucrative. And mainframe software turned out to be very expensive. You know, you pay 50000 or 100000 or so dollars. 
but little programs were, were still free until this wave of personal computing, which made that valuable. And I would observe that, that valuable programs, so the, the valuableness of programs, is really a very bad thing for the user. The user wants open software, software that can be modified and that can, be, that can participate in a progressive improvement process. It's never right at first, and uh, if the conditions are such that it will be modified in response to user requirements, as in a kind of free academic setup, then everything goes well. Uh, indeed, if it's very popular, like Lotus 1, 2, 3 or something, then people back at the company spend a lot of time and energy making it better and it gets better. But if it's just, uh, if it's appealing, if it's very important to a segment of the market, but not to a very rich segment, that can sit around now for two or three years without improving at all, and I think that uh, that's a bad thing. Uh, coherence. A lot has been said at this meeting about the, the need for the coherence of the software and the services it renders in workstations. And there we set up a thing. This talk was originally thought to be maybe about a Washington view of things, is how things looked from ARPA's point of view. But I found I really couldn't say much about that, except I would have said that the struggle between two sets of values is very clear in the eyes of the people in the federal government. They would like to see standards, a stable situation, uh, coherence software, so everything has maximal value. They would like to see technology transfer and actual use of, of software. At the same time, they would like to see it improve. They would like to see the diversity, the con competitive situation that motivates people to improve it. And uh, competitive motivation leads people to keep things a bit close to the vest. The, the, the two are, are very, very conflicting. As it has turned out, I think, in our field, pretty much the people in, interested in the diversity for the sake of improvement have, have won out. How much longer that will continue, I don't know, but I personally hope that continues a long time. From the user's point of view, learnability is very important. I've been trying very hard to think of the names of the two people at Columbia University Hudson Lab who, who made a breakthrough in the documentation world. Back in the 60s, they had a system that was, was documented on one page, and that was really adequate. You could sit down and use their system on the basis of that. But it seems to me that we ought to consider documentation to be one of the parts of a personal workstation. And if the documentation isn't good, maybe the workstation isn't really very helpful. One of the truly great software ideas that's so old now everybody accepts it as uh, commonplace, except it isn't commonplace, and that's software with the group property. That is, uh, the output of any program is suitable input for some other programs. Convenience, just common sense convenience of use. The first time I saw that was really important. I visited NORAD at Colorado Springs and got taken back into some dark mountain vault where there was a huge outlay of computer equipment. And all of the controller stations had uh, light pens and keyboards, and the light pens were on the left-hand side of the keyboard. And the poor guys were that's maybe matched by one I saw at a radio, at an electronics show, where there were the numbers zero through nine and right and left. Only trouble was they read the R on the left side, then L, then nine, then eight, seven, six. And the reason was that it had been designed by an engineer who was working from the back of the equipment. <laughs> Well, some of the things we need, and, and just two more items to close up. Um, the competition of the marketplace seems to get people to build great diversity of, of software for personal workstations. 
But where is the system for studying stuff? That seems to me a thing that is very commonplace to a lot of important work, studying technical documents, for instance. Um, see, Kane, Bob Bro, Raphael, and I once wrote a program for that, but it was back in the days when uh, we had 4,018-bit words to work in, and we didn't exactly succeed. I would really love to have one just to, to use as a, a study aid, and then a short, short and streamlined version of that might just be a reading machine. I think that we'll come to a time pretty soon where people who have workstations will really prefer to read in them because they'll be able to use supplementary services like searching and the like. I think that uh, I have come to the end of my notes. Thanks very much. Stay up there. Stay up. Maybe somebody wants to ask some questions. Yeah. Don't you want to? Uh, hold There's a place here where I must pop myself. Um, if there are any questions, I uh, think now is the time to ask them uh, of uh, Lick. Uh, I'd like to start off with with one, and that is how circumscribed were you by ARPA when you started the IPT program? Well, actually very, very little, and I don't want to brag about ARPA. It, it is, in my view, however, a, a, a very enlightened place. It was fun to work there. I think I've never encountered brighter, more creative people than the inhabitants of the third floor E-ring of the Pentagon. But that, I'll say, was a long time ago, and I simply don't know how, how bright and likable they are now. But ARPA didn't constrain me much. Possibly it was just the enlightenedness. Possibly it was that the budget was so small they didn't have time to think much about it. There were big projects in ARPA that made the computer one look uh, look puny. Now, the people who have followed me have built up the budget, and I assure you it isn't puny now. Are there any questions? Please come to the microphone, give your name, and ask your question. It's not really a question. It's John Brackett. I think uh, Lick hasn't taken much credit for something which he deserves, and maybe we should get on the record of establishing a quality of funding research and the quality of people that he brought after him in Ivan Sutherland and then Bob Taylor. But to some extent, much of what we have in personal work stations is a result of the quality of research that would funds are funded. There are many agencies I've dealt with in the past in the government where the people funding research knew far little than they should have about what was being done. And I think as the much of this field is due to what Witt started as the way he approached funding research and the caliber of people he brought out. Well, thanks, John. I don't want credit for any of that except one part, and that is having some small thing to say about who followed me. That was important. Uh, one of the things that characterized DARPA's history was a kind of a selection of foci. Thus, in one sense, it went after graphics fairly serious for a while. It went after time sharing, and in one sense, you went after time sharing. You didn't necessarily go after some of the ones that, that followed you because you weren't there. But it had a choice of, of, of somehow focusing for the period of, um, of an IPTO director on a particular thing, like time sharing, like networking, and so forth. Some of those we recognize now, the, certainly the graphics and the networking, as kind of critical components to workstations. But it never did, it seems to me, somehow conceive of and go after something called the workstation, per se. As a, do you have any reflections about, um, about why you missed that? I would observe that the ARPA office was awfully good about calling together leading lights from the contractor community. and letting them pretty much say what the good ideas were. And I'll bet if you look through those lists, the workstations weren't on them. <laughs>
All right, so that, well, that's great. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Button. Actually, I can remember, I think in workstations were difficult on Butler Lamson. Workstations were really pretty difficult in the 60s because the hardware was just too expensive. And in the 70s, when it became feasible, I can remember when I was at Park going around and talking to people in the ARPA, ARPA community about why they were not pursuing these ideas. And I remember one of the answers I got loud and clear at that time was that ARPA was putting tremendous emphasis on the proposition that they didn't want to support the development of any software or computer systems that you wouldn't be able to buy from manufacturers after they were developed. And therefore, the idea that people would build non-standard hardware was very much looked down on. Um, it's a little bit unclear to me to what extent this was the, actually the ARPA position, but it's, act, it's extremely clear to me that this is what the contractors thought. And therefore, a whole bunch of things just were not considered because they were judged to be unacceptable. Well, during Steve Lukasik's tenure as director of ARPA, there was really a tremendous emphasis on technology transfer. And, um, you know, the project offices were supposed to come up every week with uh, this week's breakthrough, and they got extra points if it were the technology transfer of something farther along the line. But, um, well, even in the face of the Defense Department's insistence upon ADA, ARPA has managed to be tolerant of... Uh, a lot of languages, and I don't know any ARPA contractors who really do it in ADA. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's true enough. I think with, in the case of workstations, it, there's a bigger threshold because... Yeah. Or maybe you just can't do it in ADA. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Doug Ross. Um, actually, in the early um, Project Mac work, uh, there was real workstation work being done. Um, in, the, in that the uh, way in which the uh, ESL display console, that kludge that showed in uh, uh, Gordon's film, but that I didn't get to covering, uh, was hooked up to the IBM 7090 and then the 94. Namely, it was first hooked up through either a PDP-7 or a PDP-9, and just to show that it was, in fact, still following the uh, uh, logic of uh, uh, building the architecture for workstation uh, like we're talking about here today, um, the, for example, we had what we called the minimum executive program that ran on the uh, PDP-9, let me call it. I think it was at that point. Uh, the minimal executive was a, a, a built-in, it would have been nowadays built into ROM, you see, but it was a built-in piece of software, and the only thing it could do is receive a message and hook it in to be processed. And it couldn't do any sending of messages even, only receive message. And the message that you first sent it, if you wanted to do more than just have things receive and go on the display uh, as a bunch of characters or some, whatever it was set up for, in fact, it was nothing there. Just, yeah, I'm sorry, just nothing. The first message you sent it was an extension to the executive that would allow it to also be able to respond and say, I got the message. But sometimes you, if you wanted it to behave just as a, as a display itself, you didn't even give it anything to say, I got the message. The reason for this was that it had limited uh, memory for supporting the cycling display, and uh, so this was our mechanism for allowing you to change the display but have the maximum amount of memory available for the display itself. And so uh, it, it really did go on, uh, depending on what pieces of further software you sent across the same pipe that uh, display data would be coming across uh, and communications from buttons and light pens coming back. Um, depending upon what pieces of the modular system you sent across that way, you got more or less behavioral characteristics out of that ESL display console workstation. So the, uh, the intriguing thing to me was that uh, um, the, there was very little follow-up in the ARPA community uh, in this graphics area in the generalized way, although, of course, all the uh, blossoming that uh, a few years later took place through the Evans and Sutherland uh, company activities uh, certainly carried the ball much, much further. Well, one of the big conflicts over the years has been, it seems to me, between time-shared systems and uh, individually appropriable ones. Time-sharing was kind of a, a, it seemed to me, a necessary step to get enough people involved in all this and to appreciate what the potential values were. But it certainly did make it difficult to deal with the uh, display and, and human interaction aspects. Um, I think you see this every, everywhere that, that um, there's uh, economics 
sort of drives you to give a lot of people minimal support, whereas to make real advance in human interaction with computers, you need pretty lavish support. You need to, if it is or were true that hardware economics double every two years, then, uh, and if it's true that it takes eight or ten years to get something from the idea stage out into use, it says the researcher who begins working on something has got to be a factor of 16 or 32 ahead of the time in his lavish expenditure of computer resources to do his work. And that's, that's it takes really very enlightened sponsors and supporters and to, to make that possible. And usually it isn't. So time sharing has held back that kind of thing. But let me say that Kluge work did transfer quickly Cy Leventhal did, I believe, the very first rotations of, poly of protein molecules on it. And the same technology that went to Princeton, where uh, Professor England, I believe it is, did a lot more good work with the same, essentially the same Kluge technology. You also started Bitzer, though, and it seems to me that was it, and going back to the technology constraint, and now I'm trying to raise the question, how can this community do technology transfer better? Because the plasma display screen, with the limitations of the technology of the day, developed some very fine graphics, and it was aimed at students, and, and on some economy of scale was relatively cheap, although it, everything's relative. And that, that went on as a sort of an orphan for a long time, without any interaction because of its unique software. Uh, now that the technology in the mini and the micro are down, we don't see much of the technology of what we learned from that. And My recollection, Jim, is that um, ARPA didn't substantially support Bitzer or the plasma display, but um, the Department of Education did. Um, Did later? Okay. And indeed, IBM did later. CD, oh, yes, Control Data did it substantially. IBM seems to be making plasma displays, though, and I don't see Control Data. How did that happen? Yeah, you're right. It was Control Data. Mm -hmm. Bert? Bert, so Bert Sutherland, one, one quick comment. Like, it seems to me that as, as we look back in history, just calling it time sharing gives it a bad connotation. I, I wish we had all called it time and data sharing. Yeah. All right, because the just the name obscures one of the main functions. Yeah. I think people understood that at the time. I remember seeing paragraphs in articles that said this really ought to be called memory sharing or something of that sort. Yeah. Well, it's it's a fantastic field. I wish it were called. Uh, something else besides workstations, because that does seem to limit the software and the interconnection aspect a little bit, but maybe that only seems so in my mind. But in fact, what they're for is, is uh, yeah, Glenn. Pardon? Yeah, I like that better. Uh, uh, we Sell better, too. I think we should all be grateful to ARPA in that they did not focus on very specific projects like workstations. That is, there was no uh, order that went out and say, we want a proposal on workstations, because goodness knows they would have gotten many of them. Instead, I think what ARPA through LIC did uh, was uh, realize that if you get N people together to do research in computing, you're going to get some reasonable fraction of N different ways of proceeding because it is just that general an instrument. And we owe a great deal to ARPA in that they did not heavily circumscribe the different directions that people took in, in those days. Um, I like to believe that the purpose of the military is to support ARPA and the purpose of ARPA is to support research. Just like I'm absolutely certain that when historians look back on these days, they will try to understand how our society could have been so foolish as not to realize that the whole purpose of AT&T 
it to support Bell Labs and that therefore divesting it and weakening Bell Labs was the silliest possible thing to do. Thank you. Back in the late 60s, there were a lot of people, there probably still are, who didn't like the Defense Department much, and one of them told me that he was writing a proposal to ARPA. It was going to be a real big one because he wanted to, he was told that uh, the, an aircraft carrier costs so much money. And if he and he could get some of his friends to make these research proposals, they could spend one aircraft carrier's worth of the government's money. 